Hello and welcome back to Where Are All My Friends. This week's episode is with Ed Walker, who works at Vivo. And this is one of the most valuable, insightful episodes I have recorded to date. And the reason I say that is one, the beginning of this episode is his story, where he explains how he got to where he's at now in his current role. But a lot of that was him doing and trying jobs in all sorts of different parts of the music industry that sounded rad on paper, but ultimately getting to something that was a little more unexpected that ended up checking every box of everything he's good at and everything he wants to do. So I feel like for anybody who's trying to find their spot in music, it's an incredibly cool lesson and story there. Then in the back half, as he now works at Vivo and has so much experience with music videos and live music on the internet, he shares so many actionable, tangible tips that you can take right after you listen to this episode and apply to your music project if you're an artist or if you're in the industry, you can advise and help your artists with like how to get much better engagement with music videos on YouTube and how to think about and maximize your budget, even if it's 200 bucks, anything with what you're filming and how to then make that go so much further for you. So just so much valuable information in this episode. I'm so stoked that he was down to join and do it. And I think that just about says it. Where are all my friends? Ed Walker. And I'm really excited for this episode because I know a little bit about you and what you're doing at Vivo. And I feel nice. like you've done a great job as a company mixing mm -hmm. live performances with concerts and in, in real life events. And mm -hmm. now kind of with the times, um, more of the mix of like be making beautiful live stream sets and really setting a mood. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed that and I really want to hear your thoughts on like where that will go and what the future of that is. And I think that'll be a really interesting, helpful conversation for listeners yeah. who are fans of music and in the business, because I think this is something we have to pay attention to. And we should mm -hmm. be excited to pay attention to it. Like this is yeah. this is a way to express ourselves and it gives artists a whole new way to communicate their music. So I'm so excited to talk about that. Yeah. But I also want to learn about you because it seems like you have this pretty well uh, established, uh, accomplished career here and I don't even know the beginning of it. So to start it off, if you could yeah. tell me a little bit about like your early days and how you got to where you're at now, I would love to hear it. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um... Yeah, so originally, if we, I mean, my accent might give me away, but I'm not, I'm based in New York now, but I'm not originally from here. So if we rewind all the way to the north of England, um, to Leeds, where I went to university, um, and I was studying creative music and sound technology, which is a very complicated way of saying the music industry. Um, so <laughs> while I was doing that, I kind of just, you know, was, I'm not a very, um, a very, I guess the book smart learner, if you will, I'm more of a kind of a, a hands-on experience kind of learn from doing. So while I was uh, doing those, that course, I was kind of getting as much possible experience as I possibly could by doing anything. So working with management companies, if anyone would let me even in the door, you know, just like even doing mail or kind of helping out with kind of just assistant stuff wherever I could get it. And, you know, as things tend to do, one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. So, um, yeah, I, while I was at university doing that, kind of gaining a little bit of experience here and there within the industry, um, straight out of university, I actually took a bit of a pivot and went into um, more marketing and brand activation. So I took a role um, basically doing events for a, uh, a company that was doing activation and experiential mainly around alcohol brands and as a 22 year old that was you know potentially the dream so um that was nice learned a lot you know i was there kind of you know at a very entry-level role but just kind of seeing the way that that kind of strategy campaign and brand all came together and how that could you could you could kind of experience or impart experience around a strategy and um, kind of just watch kind of people who are incredible what they do, ideate, deliver, and then kind of move on. So that was what I was doing. And then I was like, uh, I kind of still love the music. You know, that was kind of the dream. And that's always what I wanted to, to kind of do. So I took a, I guess it wasn't too much of a risk at the time, given my age, but I kind of just went, I'm going to go, I'm going to go freelance. So I, um, I had one contact 
that I knew actually through the agency I worked at, a, a lady called Anna Golden, who is um, a legend to to everyone in the UK. She's um, head of production at AEG now, but um, she really gave me my first kind of opportunity in the industry doing kind of rep assisting at a show. She was the rep um, kind of for, I can't even remember the promoter at the time, but kind of took that and then ran with it. So I was doing like kind of production assistant at festivals, artist liaison at festivals, worked my my way up um, again with Anna's help and a few promoters like AEG, just kind of getting to be a rep for some amazing promoters there, running their smaller shows and running some bigger shows for them. And then kind of just kind of growing my experience within repping production and kind of, you know, the the live side of music. All How at the same time at that point? I want to say probably like 25, 26. Cool. So, yeah, like, so that's a of, good age. Like you're young, yeah. but you can tell it's exciting. You're kind of like yeah. enough in your lane. Exactly. So, Cause I wonder like around that time that very much could have been your life and career. Like if you're being surrounded with that and AEG yeah. is such a big company, that's so interesting that you had mm -hmm. that chapter yet here you are yeah. at that time. Did you think that was it? Or like, were you loving it? Like, what was that like? I love production. My brain is very logical and I love working through problems. Um, but I was always a little bit jealous of the, you know, the creative director that would walk in or the the lighting director would walk in and then just do like the really cool shit. Like they're just like programming a show and like adding the emotion and the like creative. I was like, mm. I want to learn a bit of that. So you know, it was kind of like, I loved, and I like, I, I got doing some really exciting stuff with like stage managing and kind of production managing for some decent, you know, some decent artists and, you know, good festivals and, you know, did some good production management stuff, which has definitely helped me out, obviously, and put me in good stead. But for me, it was kind of, you know, I, I loved the, the problem solving meets creativity. And I think, you know, we'll talk later about how maybe those two things came together with the content we're doing now. Yeah, that's so. cool, though. I just I love hearing those bits of the career journeys because I feel like the job description on paper versus yeah. what it actually is, is so yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. because you can have the dream job on paper mm -hmm. and you're like, AEG, I work with this, I do this show and this and this. And then you kind yeah. of see that thing where you're like, this is cool, but it doesn't translate. Mm -hmm. And perhaps even a job that has a slightly less uh, sexy title, at times you can be like, oh, wait, this is it. And I'm just obsessed with hearing how people navigate that. And that, like the, you know, you go and do this and you take this away from it. And you're like, okay, I love this. But what if this was a part of it? And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. Like you were listening to your gut, you were doing these things, but you're like, Okay, there's more here. Yeah, I think that's for me, you know, like when you're you when you're at school or you know you're a massive music fan and you're looking at it and obviously like definitely I'm you know sensing a reason you know one of the reasons for your podcast is like I want to work in music, cool, what does that mean? Like what yeah. even are the jobs? You know, it's like yeah. what what how do you do how do you produce this product, right? So yeah, you've got to start learning and see what interests you and what doesn't and what interests you in what way and kind of you know what what kind of you know meshes with who you are and what you want want to do so yeah that was very much what I kind of saw and then I was like still freelancing doing kind of event stuff so I was working for this really incredible European events agency that did like 10 million dollar weddings and then I'd be going to like the Camden Underground and doing like a death metal show and it was like crazy cool so it's like these worlds meeting together and then um down the line one summer when i was working um for mama group at the great skate festival um this company called vivo um had taken over a stage at the great skate festival for the first year they just launched in the uk as an american company and the 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 person in charge of um, the reps was like oh you do that venue and i was like okay cool and then here we are, you know? So I, I encountered Vivo for the first time 
through you know a veil of ignorance as to who they were and what they were i was like i recognize them it's like that logo on the videos on the internet yes, right dude yes right you know? and then and then i was like oh cool nice and then you know did this amazing kind of stage production they had their own thing going i was representing the festival kind of helped them through a few kind of issues and thoughts and kind of just kind of because they were starting in the uk and then i was like cool great like bye see you and then um like went our own ways and then tom um who uh was head of content and um kind of programming in the uk at the time um like emailed me a few i think it was like months or weeks later and said oh we've got this thing that we're thinking of doing for halloween in the uk um like would you be interested in coming in like like event manager for us and i was like yeah obviously and then i guess honestly like eight years later here i am this <laughs> is like the synopsis so it's wow. kind of wow yeah it was it was crazy What's cool to me in that too is you didn't expect it to come together that way. You were just doing your no. thing. No, and yeah, yeah, yeah. If I were to hear, like, if I were to see a Vivo job open up on the internet or LinkedIn or wherever you look for jobs, I wouldn't first go to event production and understanding live music being the first mm -hmm. thing that they would hire for. I'd think maybe I'd need to have more of like a tech background or understand yeah. um, more of that side of like internet based work. So sure. I just love that lesson too of it's sometimes in these very unlikely spots where it's like, oh wait, this is this perfect fit and this company yeah. that I, maybe you wouldn't even expect has this perfect role. Yeah. And that does lead us a bit to what you're doing right now because mm -hmm. and, and tell me because i'm i'm assuming a little yeah. bit but from what i can see you are now in a spot where you're working with vivo and artists to come up with these performances and really yeah. make these events happen right yeah 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 so i was um freelance in the uk and then i, I don't it all obviously blurs a little bit timeline wise but then i was offered a kind of temporary per, a temporary freelance position i was like yeah cool and then i was offered a full-time position um and i was like great and then um tom who was uh, the, the guy that employed me um was transferred to the us to build out the kind of to mirror the kind of the the structure and the way that we operated in europe and um, in america mm -hmm. and you know it was obviously good at what he did um so they brought him over and then you know or forever thankful he gave me the opportunity to move over to america and to actually build out a new function in the team which at the time was basically the live performance meets um content capture so anything that was either live without cameras or live with cameras um so i was doing that for kind of you know two years ish year and a half and then um i was kind of given offered the opportunity to kind of head up all original content and production for vivo so um yeah as i sit now i'm the the kind of uh, vp of original content and production and in that i oversee um a few functions mainly um the content team within which we've got various different sub teams obviously you know creative producers line producers the edit and post team Kind of a few things in there then i oversee the design team um I have a guy called sid heads up he's a head of design and he kind of i work with him and all the design function for vivo um and also events and the event function within the company so all those things together is what i oversee right now that's pretty cool yeah it's and it's, it's a nice place to be it sounds like that really does check the boxes of like you finding your path of like, these are all of my strengths. This is everything I like. And you've really done a good job translating that to a job that lets you do that, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's kind of, you know, yeah, exactly. It's things, things working out in a kind of fortuitous way. And yeah, kind of seeing things from a slightly different lens, because obviously I, I was working in content and, you know, across like the branded stuff that I was doing previously, or, you know, whether it was a arena show that people were filming, like obviously content aware, um, and then working at Vivo, you know, mainly to begin with just event wise, no cameras, then adding cameras onto the live stuff and then kind of completely immersing in, you know, whether it is live performance or, um, scripted content or, you know, the social content that we do, the strategies around that, 
and the creative that kind of feeds it. So, yeah. Dude. Lots. Okay, so now it's uh, it's sweet brag time. So okay. having been there for a little while, mm-hmm. um, I don't know all of them. I only was I only found little bits. But like, what are yeah. some artists that you've worked with, and what are some things as you look at what you've done with Vivo, where you're like, damn, we really did this. Like, what what events, what artists, like, what are some cool things that we got? I here? mean, yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a few of them. I mean, you obviously you sometimes become a little bit jaded if you do it for too long. So it's nice to kind of think back and actually contextualize it and be like, oh, okay. Um, I mean. There, we did a. We used to do a format called Presents, which is where we we partnered with an artist on a big album release, and then you know we, as in Vivo, were given the like incredible honor of designing their creative for the show and filming it. So you know, working um, with Ariana Grande when she did Dangerous Woman, we did a show in a synagogue in the Lower East Side, an ex synagogue in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. We did this projection mapping where there was just like this crazy 3D stuff going on. And to work with like Ariana herself, to work with her her like choreography team, her creative director, her production people, to bring that together, to correlate with the release of a massive album. Incredible. We did a similar thing with The Weeknd um, when he released Starboy. Um, and we did a show in LA. And it was kind of, it's the opportunity to work with a megastar, but we as a, entity you know we weren't there to make money out of it so we were giving these tickets away at five dollars and the the area we did it in la it was these fans we got like two thousand fans and it was like uber super fans from this part of la that you know frankly probably can't afford the 200 dollar arena ticket shows and you could just see and could feel it in the room and you know we had this like he played the album we filmed it i got to work with him and his team you know and my team internally on designing the show programming the show and then we had a little guy called um kendrick lamar came out and did a verse <laughs> like and like if you go on to it it was um you know oh god i the song title escapes me but the the track from starboy with the with the um collab with kendrick is online go on to it and then we did it so that uh, kendrick started his verse off stage and then he walks on stage so the whole audience is like yeah 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 it's just a pre-record and then he walks on and I'd never heard a room lose their mind more. So like, just like stuff like that. And then, you know, all the way up to present day this year, we've come full circle, work with the weekend again on a uh, official like performance, which is a format we can kind of touch on a little bit. Um, yeah. So did that with the weekend, did that with Ariana, did that with Justin Bieber. We've just done one with J Balvin. Um, so yeah pretty big artists working pretty closely with them that's so cool and like what i think of there and the conversation i want to have because i always try to make this a a podcast that 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 helps anybody listening right like anybody Mm -hmm. at any level because i think there are industry professionals that listen to this but i also think there's like independent artists that are always trying to think with what they can do yeah so you're doing it at the biggest level. Like those are the biggest artists. You have the resources, you have these great, great things. But when Mm -hmm. you really boil it down and think about it, that model still works for anybody. Like I, I, or my question for you is these live performances that people are doing and these events and things like that, I think anybody Mm -hmm. should be paying attention to. So I'm curious with your expertise in it, What's that space look like? Like as, as we're in 2021, yeah. should everybody be paying attention to this? Should everybody be figuring out how they can do stuff like this? Is it one of those things where you should wait as an artist until you do get a crazy big partner like Vivo to like go and do it big? Like how how do the two how do they yeah. how do they marry together? Nice, yeah. Um, interesting. So I mean, as a, as a company, Vivo, you know, we we work with. I mean, there is. I, especially, I think, you know, with probably some of your listeners, you know, there's an assumption that Vivo is a, you know, a mega monolith that works with triple platinum A-listers only, right? And yeah. we definitely work with the biggest artists in the world. You know, I can't, I can't hide that fact. But we also work with independent artists, independent managers, independent labels. Um, and, you know, for us, it's all about nurturing relationships from, you know, before artists get signed to major labels, we want to be in there with them and kind of helping them out with their, you know, their visuals. So, you know, music videos or, or similar. So 
you know, we, to your question, you know, I think the answer is everyone should be, you know, thinking holistically and thinking in a way to maximize every opportunity and create opportunities for themselves. So, you know, obviously that's easy to say if you've got a big budget, like you're saying, but in a smaller way, you know, how do you take what resource you have and think about that in a kind of more, a more 360 way? So if you're an independent artist and you're filming a music video, you know, how don't just think about filming the music video. You're, you're there, you're on a content shoot. What is the content you can get out of? that shoot so it's saying you know you're filming the video but you're likely going to have a set and a, and a crew no matter how small with you so you've got social platforms you've got marketing to do for the video you've got things that you could you know add on to break out or extend the album so that the video or track you know life cycle so you know it's something that we do as a company on all of our shoots we we look at when we're filming with you know ariana grande we look at it as obviously one of the biggest artists in the world giving us six live performances what else can we work with ariana on for that for that campaign to build it out across our network across her platforms and to kind of make the most out of having a camera in the room and yeah, yeah so that's kind of the, the the starting point i guess for most things that we do and that yeah i think it's kind of you know I mean, I was going to say tape costs nothing, but it does cost when we shoot on 35 mil, but digital tape <laughs> yes. costs nothing, right? If you're in a, if you're in a room and you've got a, a camera and some lights there, don't just film a music video, like build it out and kind of maximize the opportunity that you have in front of you. Yeah. I love that. And honestly, I feel like I kind of set you up. That was an awkward way to ask that question. And I think you took <laughs> that and answered it very well because <laughs> It like I love the way you said that and I love the way you look at that because anyone, any artist can take those moments that they do have a shoot or anything mm. and they can use there's so much more to it than just the video. Yeah. So I love that you say that. And then I was also thinking like something that I noticed in like the Billie Eilish, like the latest Vivo Billie Eilish performances, mm -hmm. like it feels like the album. So yes. I love yeah, 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 that. Yeah, yeah. I love like, I wish more artists would take a second and think about like, if we're making this music video set, how does this tie into the album? How does this tie in to the overall branding? What's the theme? Because then when a partner, like when someone like Vivo gets involved or anything, you have more to build. It feels more real. Something that I wonder with what's the the future of music, live music performance. Mm -hmm. I, I think that making these live stream events and making these beautiful sets is so awesome. As a fan, as in everything around music, I love it. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, what do you think happens as we as we come out in like into more live music again and we get live shows back? Mm -hmm. Where where do you see that going? Like, do you think we still have like these really beautiful curated sets and live streams? Does it go back to live performances? Does that, do we get a hybrid? Like, what do you, yeah. where do you see that going? That's an that's a interesting question. So we, um, you know, I talk regularly to quite a few people about, you know, I guess exactly this, this question and kind of, you know, forecasting and seeing what people are predicting. And I think anyone that thinks they know probably doesn't um so and where where does a fan go to get the best version the best live performance of a song for for me contextually so you know the official live performances the the big productions that we do with the with the a-lister artists um that came from a place where myself and, and micah who's the content ep at, at vivo you know as actual music fans ourselves you know i i think live performance is kind of the highest, you know, the highest form of, of music for me personally. I, I love the so kind of good. the immediacy and the reality of it, right? So, but the question for me as a music fan was like, where do I go to see to see a live version of something? And the answer was maybe like a late night show or maybe an award ceremony. But like we like everyone in the industry and you know i'm sure fans as well realize that there are kind of factors and constraints around those two two elements so it's not the best most realized version of the performance so you know we we ideated and kind of came up with like 
in in an ideal like you know blue sky thinking like what does the ideal performance of a song look like yes. and how how can we work with an artist to deliver that and that's where the official live performance came from so you know, we we work hand in hand with the artists. It's interesting you saying about Billie Eilish because you know we you know from from the beginning of that project work with her, her creative directors, her management, and say right, tell us about the album, the thing that's coming in four months time. What is the creative? How how do you guys feel? What 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 means something to you, Billie? And like what stands out? And how can we anchor this in something that is real to you? So that's yeah. how that's how all those things came together for us. It kind of. A year into that, as we were kind of kicking off with the weekend to do his first official live performance series, um, COVID was hitting. And then there was this kind of shift in the industry of, oh, we can't do live, live with audience anymore. So, and, you know, campaigns and the kind of what's happening, who knows? So let's actually take a moment and then focus on these bigger productions and nice production value live streams or as live pre-tapes. So strangely what we were building as a company you know without the foresight of a global pandemic kind of hit just as this kind of kind of spark happened in the industry and then subsequent to that we worked with you know Justin Bieber, Billie Eilish, Ariana Grande, J Balvin so those we were offering those guys that real like that tangible opportunity to represent their work in in lens so yeah you know for me we've had these, i've had these conversations with artists as well you know like you know you know on set with them being like what's happening with your, your guys tours like what what are you thinking like where does it go from here and you know everyone's got different thoughts and different answers but for me it's that it's it's the hybrid thought you know it's kind of what is exactly like the point i was talking about with the one video shoot you know a video shoot is not just one thing anymore you know you've got to think cross platforms cross networks you know cross time zones different endpoints different optimization between social between vod between linear programming all those things yeah. have different nuance to them so you've got to think holistically with something like an official live performance so you know the the any of the artists we've worked with what would it look like if we did that performance as we do now but then we built that set as a touring environment that could go on the road and then they could perform within this environment in a bigger way so there's the you know the official live performances there's the live performances and then there's some myriad of of content capture in between that would be you know a you know a mini doc or a making of and you know, you kind of weave those two two areas of the same project together and then build out a more holistic uh, project. So that's the kind of how yeah. I see the bones of it. And then, you know, future tech, we'll see what happens with people, you know, teleporting into shows that they're not really at. But, you know. I love the way you just broke that down. And it has me, like, I had this thought, like, where you're like, that's the bones of it. And I was just like, oh my God, he's right. And it's like, now if the bones exist, it's back to the creatives mm -hmm. to figure out how to do the coolest versions of that. Yeah. Like we don't really know. Like we've seen like really, really good official live performances. Mm -hmm. We've seen really great tour production. Yeah. But now we have this world where it's like, how can we put these things together? And exactly. I was talking to some friends about this. I think it was a previous episode that we touch on it a little bit, but like, there's probably a world where a tour gets it gets sent out and you do this whole beautiful production, but then at the end of the tour, somewhere where it makes sense, you have the production, so why not record your perfect live performances and do some kind of live stream event afterwards exactly. for all the people that couldn't come to the shows? Mm -hmm. But like that's just the bones of an idea. Like yeah. now I feel like we're about to see this whole new wave of how people translate that and how yeah. people use that. And damn, that's exciting, huh? For sure, for sure. And it's, you know, the, you know, COVID obviously was a, is a horrific kind of thing for everyone to go through collectively. Um, but, you know, sometimes these, these things shake loose, you know, opportunity and break patterns. So, you yeah. know, to, to your point that you were saying, you know, what historically, why was a tour 
separate to a tour film or, you know, all these things. And these are historic deals, partnerships and structures within promoters, labels, management companies. So, you know, exclusions around tours and the creative of that tour, it belongs to potentially a promoter. Sometimes it belongs to the management company. Historically, there was this kind of insurmountable kind of, you know, backlog of just things. And it's like, okay, fine. We'll just do, we'll stick in our lane. COVID comes along, shakes everything loose and promoters are now like, oh, okay, no, no live shows. Let's do streams. So it's like, oh, so now you see the value. So, and then managers are like, okay, cool. Can we ticket and monetize the streams? Promoters are like, oh yeah. And then it's kind of like the world starts becoming a little bit more um, malleable. So it's kind of yeah, really everybody starts playing ball. Yeah, way. we're at a really interesting inflection point. And also, as you said, like over the last year, year and a half, people have been doing crazy stuff with technology that, you know, would never would never have happened in a year if people hadn't been forced to do it and experience it. And we've learned what's good and what isn't so good. And then, you know, we take that and move on to the next phase. Dude, you just said something there, though, that that like really got me where I was like, that must be a whole different world. Like I as a consumer can go on YouTube and be like Ariana Grande live performance or Billie mm-hmm. Eilish live performance. And then it's like this beautiful production. It's so all I have to do is search and I see it. But what goes into the back end of what you just explained for a company like mm-hmm. Vivo or like to do that and to make that work and to worry about all the royalties and how this goes to this and this and this, like that is probably such a crazy undertaking that y'all deal with. And you probably mm-hmm. go through so much red tape to make that happen. And yeah. that's probably not talked about nearly enough to be like, oh, cool. Here's this beautiful piece. Yeah. Actually stop and think about what went into that to get all of that red tape removed to yeah. get it done. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, so Vivo is obviously, well, not obviously, but, you know, we are, you know, the world's leading music video networks. You know, we, we distribute across so many different endpoints, you know, YouTube being our, our most well-known currently, but we have a massive growing distribution network across connected televisions. Um, and then, you know, even, even saying that YouTube is consumed across cell phones, across desktops, across, across televisions. So the, the network across what, across we, um, across which we distribute has different endpoints within it as well. So if you want to break down what you just said, you could extrapolate that by our endpoints, which, you know, are in the in the tens and then each different endpoint has different characteristics and and um requirements so there's that and that is overseen and managed by an incredible team of people at vivo you know whether it's our legal team our finance team that are the guys that are guys and girls who are working through the royalties and working out who gets what and then you know you've got on top of that our legal team you've got our business development team and then you've got, you know, our labor relations team, who are the people who are translating all of this to the labels and the partners. And then you've got our content team. And then on top of all of that, you've got our sales team who are working with everybody to help monetize these videos for artists. So yeah, it's, you know, Vivo's kind of been not silently, but we have been, you know, building, and you know, we're kind of nearly 12 years old. Every month we get 25 billion views across our network. Um, so, you know, we are in a place now with the expertise and knowledge we have to kind of take music videos and the, the kind of creativity around music visuals to the, to the next level, which we are and kind of, you know, always adding value to artists and partners. So, yeah, so that part of it is less difficult, but it's still a factor. And, you know, Everything that my myself and my team do day in, day out in terms of creating content, you know, we have a, a lot of considerations and factors that go into everything, you know, from, you know, logos on T-shirts if an artist is performing and all the way through to, um, yeah, all the way through to the creative and kind of the, the capture of the actual performance. It's just nuts. Like it's, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm learning so much in this conversation and I yeah. love hearing these deep dive mm. bits of it, but it makes me respect it so much more. And it's so cool to talk to people who make these things happen because 
that was also something in starting this podcast was like, mm. it's so easy to focus on like, oh, cool. I love this specific band. Let me talk to the singer of the band or whatever. Yeah. And that's awesome. But there's so many people in the music industry that mm -hmm. do so much to make cool shit happen and you don't yeah. know them and you don't understand it. And like just this, like I'm sitting here and my mind is racing of like, <laughs> wow, it takes so much to make these things happen. And it gives me this whole new respect for the people like yourself, where it's just like, damn, like you're out here, like you're just as much of an artist. You're just as much of a creative along with your whole team. Like y'all are out here doing it, making this whole new platform for music to exist. Yeah, no, no, I really, um, yeah, I really appreciate that. And it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, and for, for me, you know, if we rewind to the, the first time I encountered Vivo in the UK, you know, eight years ago, it was like, you know, it's that, that thing on YouTube. And then, you know, fast yeah. forward now, and it's like, it's mind boggling as to kind of, you know, the, the position and the, the importance that Vivo plays in, in the distribution of, of content. So, you know, we, we represent, you know, you know, we were co-owned or part-owned, you know, by, um, by record labels. So we are, you know, the people collectively that represent and distribute and maximize the, the value of, of their video assets. And, you know, yeah. that's, that's a massive responsibility and, you know, it's, so it's changed and we, we constantly learn things about our catalog that are really interesting and insightful and, you know, music, music videos and music content is one of the only forms of content that doesn't necessarily devalue either creatively, culturally or financially at ages. So if you think yeah. about um, Diana Ross, like a, a video by Diana Ross, you know, or, or name any artist, like that, that content, that song and that video is just as viable, exciting and kind of, you know, engaging now as the day it was recorded. If you look at sports content or if you look at movies necessarily, you know, if you want to you want to look at a movie that's um, 40 years old versus a music video, you know, I think, um, you know, you know. You're in an wow, interesting or place. sports content, dude. Mm -hmm. Like how, like, once you know who won the game, how much exactly. do you really want to go back? Exactly. Like, I guess there's certain plays and highlights, but like, yeah, yeah wow. Which is, which is our kind of, uh, you know, the, the way that we work with the advertising industry as well is kind of highlighting that. And we, we see these patterns that no one else does because we have half a billion videos, but you know, there are certain times of the year when certain videos will, will reoccur and, you know, everyone loves to rickroll people. So yeah. <laughs> right, you, you think it, but that video spikes once a year when everyone shares it to Rickroll people. So like the, there are these, these patterns and trends that kind of are insane. And we work with advertisers on that and say, we know this time every year people are going to do an April Fool's joke and Rickroll people. That video is in our library. Let's do a campaign. So it's like just knowing the nuance and the the understanding of the, the culture and how it's how it's consumed is and being the custodians of a library of content that doesn't de depreciate or devalue and knowing how to program and use that is kind of a, a really exciting opportunity. It's so cool. And yeah. now I feel like also for the listener, if there's some edits and cuts and whatever, we mm -hmm. were dealing with a slightly unstable internet yeah, connection yeah. and some some issues. Mm -hmm. um, so if it cuts together a little bit, that's what that is. But yeah. to conclude and to like come to this, I had this thought and this point that I asked you, and I feel like I can ask it better now after you've explained all of that. And that is for anyone listening to this that mm -hmm. doesn't have the resource and entire massive team yeah. of Avivo to mm -hmm. make this happen, but they're sitting there listening to this being like, yeah, wow, music videos, live performance, uh, it's valuable. It's exciting. Mm -hmm. How do you maximize that? And I loved what you said about thinking more than just the music video, but that question again of like, how does anyone at any position in their career mm -hmm. who can make a music video or make any kind of content around their music, how do you maximize that? How do you make that something that's helpful for you at any time and make the best yeah. of it? Well, I, yes, yeah, it's, it's a good question. And it's the, the starting point I would, I, I'll tell you how 
you know, how we make content, you know, and that would Ooh. kind of help anybody, I guess. So that's you know, awesome. So we, we have a, uh, format, we have, have multiple formats, but let's, let's talk in generalities, right? So the starting point for me, my team, and us as a company, if we were to make content is to understand where it's going, why, and who's going to consume it. And that's important because the end point changes the framework and the piece of content that we're going to make. So it's, a, it's about educating yourself on the, the end point and the, the audience and the consumption of that end point. So for instance, in YouTube, in, on, on YouTube, if a uh, piece of content starts and there is not a recognizable face front and center, that really damages retention across the piece of content. So that's something that you will do passively, but not understand. And then what happens is YouTube is built is built on algorithms and those algorithms basically service the whole network. And our content library across YouTube is heavily, um, heavily built on the up next bar that you'll see. And if you know that if you don't start the track straight away and you don't see the musician straight away or the famous face, um, people click off it, that tells a YouTube algorithm that this is a less valuable piece of content. And then that tells the algorithm not to serve it to anybody. So that you go into what you could call a, a you know a death spiral of content. That means you're not going to get service. So let's say the up next algorithm is 60%. That's not our figure, but let's say it is. You've instantly yeah. lost 60% of potential traffic. So there's that. And a, a learning to make this a tangible point, you know, we work with record labels and really great, amazing creative directors and directors all the time to say, hey guys, like, like I'm not naming names, but like massive artists will have these um, narrative videos. So a video that starts their, let's say in the desert, um, and then they're walking through the, you know, a, a metaphorical journey. And then the video starts with the creative. What happens is if they upload that versus a lyric video where it starts and there's no visuals, just lyrics, the lyric video will always outperform. And we have case studies where a lit, I'm talking about a triple A-list artist. A lyric video has double performed what the official video has because the beginning of it hurts retention and hurts the algorithm. So like that knowledge on YouTube can help somebody, you know, you could already winning before you even started filming. You know, if you just know you these just things. shared <laughs> just that I'm sitting here and my mind is blown for the yeah. years I've worked in music. And it's so simple. You're saying, it, yeah. like, oh, makes sense. Mm -hmm. But like you just shared gold my with goodness. how simply you explained that. Nice. Oh, and my God. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Of course. And yeah. And then, you know, you translate that across different endpoints and, you know, a linear programming or a VOD uh, experience on a on a, at a larger screen like a television. We, we have data on consumption metrics that it's a much more, uh, it's a co-viewing experience. So people don't normally watch it alone. They watch it with a partner's flatmate's family. Um, and then um, there's a session time, which is so much longer on, on connected television than on a, a phone or a, a desktop that would be a VOD searchable environment. So in that environment, you have the potential to use um, a little, you have a little bit more leeway with the creative, it's less cutthroat algorithmically. So, you know, you have that endpoint. And then, you know, what we say with, you know, the, to the point of the YouTube algorithm and the, you know, optimizing content for it, the world is not just your music video anymore, right? There's the, there's the marketing, there's the environment, there's the world you want to create around that music video. So yeah, what, what we'd say is, you know, if you, if you have a creative concept for a music video and it is, you know, a 20 second intro where you're walking through a forest and you get to your performance set, still film it, do exactly what you wanted to do, but think about the delivery of those particular, of that content. So break out the yeah. intro and have that as a social asset across your platforms that teases and excites people and then just go into the video when you release it. And then if people want to consume it, they can consume it how they want. But don't think like it's 1995 anymore and you just have to service this like Opus Maximus music video that has a 25 second intro. So, yeah. Dude, that like that concept, what you just explained there, 
I don't know if I don't know if you're a big book guy. I just finished this book, uh, Story Brand uh, okay. Marketing. Nice. And I, it, it's that. It's like, does it pass? They call it the caveman test, right? Mm -hmm. Can you see instantly what it is so quickly? Yeah. And that concept to me, I was like, wow, I'm really overthinking a lot of things. And I, I think artists will tend to do that, where like mm -hmm. they want to make art, they want to make something beautiful. So they'll do this whole, we're coming through a desert and this and yeah. this and this and this. And you're like, okay, awesome. That's art. That's sick. That's amazing story. Mm -hmm. But for the consumer, where are they consuming it and what do they want to see and what are they looking for? Yeah. The way that you just explained that is mm -hmm. so valuable because you're not saying take it away. No. You're just saying know where you're putting it and give mm -hmm. yourself the chance to get served to the audience that wants to see it exactly. and then figure it out. Because if you take that forest analogy, and you're like, okay, cool. It starts in this forest, blah, 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 blah. Well, then when you do go and you're, do your cool, sick production live performance with Vivo, set it up in a forest and mm -hmm. it'll all make sense. And yeah, you can exactly. do that. Yeah. But yeah. just don't shoot yourself in the foot with putting it at the beginning yeah. of a video that will never get seen. Then that's, it's, it's wow. That's, yeah. The, the you most just yeah. shared gold. Well, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. And kind of we, you know, we as a company and we have teams of people that kind of, we have data and research scientists and analysts that, that look through this stuff all the time. So anyone listening at record labels or managers or management companies reach out to Vivo because we have all of this at hand, but you know, the, in terms of, you know, yeah, exactly. Like I was saying, it's about understanding the, the end point and not assuming because I, you know, when, I, when we first started doing our kind of massive deep dive into YouTube and consumption and across other elements and the CTV consumption on our network, you know, I had assumptions that were wrong, you know, just like right. things that logic, like, you know what I mean? Like a, a triple A lister who has this $2 million intro that they filmed with Scorsese not didn't happen but you know what i mean like right the, of yes. course people are going to tune in and watch this and be like engaged no they they're not and like it's like right. but, but but you sure and we're like yeah here's the data like it's just like oh okay so let's start thinking about this in a different way so yeah and all, all that data is available you know it's like best best practice so youtube has that out there and you know social media has best practice out there as well and it's just kind of knowing that it's there for a reason and to kind of, you know, pay attention. And instantly people, I hear people because, you know, my team were those people saying, well, all these rules are going to, they're going to ruin our creativity and they're going to stop, you know, they're going to stop what we want to deliver. Like you're saying a director or a, a massive artist might, you know, but it's, you know, for me, it's about looking at those as, um, you know, factors and constraints but working with them rather than against them so yeah it's, it's, it's just a, part of a game then yeah it's about it's just yeah. a rule in the game that you're like okay cool if we know that this is a factor how mm -hmm. do we how do we have fun with it while yeah. still using it and mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah. that's awesome like just using it with you not against you kind of thing yeah for sure and that's that's literally yeah and and so for me making the most of your resource you know, ties into that. So it's thinking about, you know, as a, as a independent or an unsigned artist, you know, if you have 200, you know, dollars or pounds or whatever you're working with, make the most of that money. So think about, you know, not only the shoot being a video, but it's your entire campaign and how can you use assets that tie in creatively. Then you take that creative from the video and like you're saying, export it into a live performance, whether it's in a club for a hundred people, you can still have a creative through line that starts to build up into something that feels more tangible and holistic than thinking about things ind independently. And, you know, creativity, you know, doesn't cost any money unless you're hiring a consultant, but as you know, people listening to this podcast, you know, inherently creative people, you know, money is a factor and it helps make things easier, but it doesn't make things better, you know? And, and for me, yeah. you know, it's about how do you work with the money you have in a creative way? Um, and, you know, ascertaining things that cost a lot of money, but figuring out how you could do those yourself. So for instance, with Vivo, the way that we work is we, we have an, in, we have an internalized production team. So, you know, we have key creative positions in house. Um, so like 
I, I and my team have, you know, multi-cam directors, single cam directors, you know, creative producers, creative directors. We have editors who are incredible at doing like VFX and post work. We have, you know, designers who add an incredible amount of value with titles and resources. So if we were to do a traditional content distribution partner model and export, you know, 95% of the production to another company or companies, our budgets would go up tenfold. But, you know, we, yeah. we, we made a strategic decision, you know, four years ago, um, you know, from the SLT down to build up the resource in-house that v you don't come to Vivo only because we are the world's, you know, leading music video network. You come to Vivo because you want to work with the people at Vivo, whether that's label side, whether it's booking side, whether it's our legal team who are, you know, incredible to work with, or, or whether it's the creative producers, like you come to Vivo because we care and we deliver the best work around. So like, it's about, you know, thinking, yeah, building, building your resource appropriately so you can kind of spend in front of the lens rather than behind it. This was such like so insightful so right. informative so good like everything like you're just a pro like i feel it like you've done this enough where you just think about it in such a good way and it, like what yeah. you shared so simply is lessons that i i hope people amazing. could learn in college but i don't know that was yeah. that was amazing. big right there amazing yeah good i'm glad i'm glad it's been been good to kind of talk through stuff and lay out a little bit of what we're up to and maybe what's coming in the future. Dude, it's amazing. So then my question, and I, I don't know uh, if you, if you want to be in the spotlight or not, but how do people, how do people learn more? How do people say thank you and find you? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think like Instagram is good. You know, my, my Instagram yeah. is very underwhelming, which is intentional. Um, but yeah, I'm, but it's I'm enough on to send a DM and say, thank you. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm on there. I think I'm Ed double underscore Walker. The kind of lesson for me and what I've learned through the industry, like I kind of highlighted earlier, you know, the kind of, you know, the Anna Golden who gave me my first proper opportunity to someone called Emma Reynolds, who's an incredible stage manager and production manager. She does the main stage and production at Glastonbury. And she was just like someone that helped me and gave me some great opportunities to Tom Connerton, who like, you know, helped me out at Vivo and kind of, you know, opportunity there. You know, I like to try and help or give people, you know, direction or kind of say where, where they could try or could go. So I think, yeah, if people want to reach out, that's um that's always nice that's awesome that's so cool and I, again i just i love that someone like yourself took the time to share this information and to tell your story because i think there's people out there that would love to be in a role like yourself and maybe don't realize that a role exists like that maybe mm -hmm. they do need to go on tour and produce things and then find out that something like this exists so i love hearing those stories and being yeah. like yeah like this is chapters to your journey all lead to these amazing things, but also you sharing so much that artists and teams and managers and labels can think with and, yeah. and put out a better product. So you did all of the things that I love in this episode. I learned so much. You had such right. a rad story. This is like, what a friggin' treat. Thank you amazing. so of much, course. dude. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been fun to talk. So there it is, Ed Walker's episode. I hope you liked that one as much as I did. I hope you got as much value and insight out of that one. He blew my mind with some of those YouTube tricks. So I really hope you can use them and I hope you can apply them for your project. If you're watching and you notice the different background, I'm in Florida right now. So that's the reason for the different setting. And for a little bit of the internet technical issues, I hope you made it through all right. I made do with what I had and stitch it together as best as possible. But we had a little bit of a drop connection here and there. But thank you for listening all the way to the end. Again, if you're down to share this on social media, if you're down to tell your friends about this and share it with people that would get value out of it, it would mean so, so much. And as always, thank you for watching and listening. I'll be back next week with another episode.